Hi, so yesterday we talked, uh, well, we didn't really talk. We looked at the story of Tamar and Amnon um, and kind of that, like, twisted weirdness of it. Pretty much, you have Amnon, who's like the half-brother of Tamar, both um, kids of David. Amnon sees Tamar and's like, wow, she's a good-looking thing, invites her over for dinner, kind of, and she's not interested, but he ends up raping her. David finds out. He does nothing about it. Um, and so strange thing with that, why does he not do anything about it? Well, first he loves his son, right? He's like, I don't really want to get down that rabbit hole. Um, but also punishing his firstborn child, who would have been next in line for the throne, would be like super duper embarrassing for the royal family. So he was just like, let's keep this under the rug, not worry about it at all. Tamar, obviously, is, like, not doing great. She just got raped. Um, and on top of that, back in the olden days, if you were not a virgin, you did not get married. Like, the idea is that a girl is a virgin when she gets married. You know, like, with, when Joseph got all huffy and puffy because Mary was pregnant? That's because he thought that she slept with somebody else and like wasn't pure when he was gonna marry her same idea here so like tamar now has like little to no chance of getting married because she's not a virgin anymore so it's kind of like obviously rape's still a very big deal but there's just that other element that maybe we wouldn't have today absalom the other son gets super ticked off that david's not doing anything and decides to kill his brother amnon um, after doing that, he's super scared, obviously, because he just murdered someone, um, and he flees to Gesher for three years. David, he loves Absalom, or Absalom, sorry, um, and just decides not to punish him, because he loves him, and he wants his son back, and Amnon's dead, so, like, okay. Well, a little sketchy, huh? And so, now, um, we are going to look at at what Absalom, Absalom ends up doing, um, causing quite a ruckus and a rebellion, okay? So first off, David doesn't punish his kids, one, because of the embarrassment, and two, because he loves his kids so much, um, but he forgets that whole, when you love someone, you also got to be their dad and crack the whip, but we'll talk more about that later. So what does Absalom decide to do? He decides to rebel and try and take the leadership, the kingly role from his dad. How does he do this? Well, he decides to stand at the gates of the of the kingdom of Jerusalem. So remember the gates surround like the gates of Jericho. And so there's one entrance. And so he stands there and he just tells everybody, oh, King David's not, not going to answer your requests. He's, he's too busy for you. Nope, he, he doesn't care about your requests. So don't go in and ask him. He doesn't care. But you know what? If I was king, I would care. I would listen to you. And so as stupid as it sounds, he started changing the hearts of the people and they all were like super mad against David. And we're like, Absalom would be a great king. He would actually listen to us. In verse 15, or in, in chapter 15, verse 10, he sends secret messengers to tell everybody, hey, when you hear me blow this horn, you need to pronounce that my, that I'm king, Absalom's king. And even though it's dumb, Absalom was just trying to steal their hearts by like the way he looked and the way he acted, which was not truthful. The people were just like, cool, sounds good. He sounds way better than King David. And they switched their alliance totally to be with Absalom. Um, so there's that. Why do you think David didn't just like crush the rebellion right there and then rather than just like run away. Cause remember in the video you just watched, David just decides to run away. He hears this rebellion, he runs away. Well, there are three reasons. Number one, the rebellion was pretty widespread and pretty big. It would have been very hard to suppress it. Okay. Number two, David didn't want the city of Jerusalem to be destroyed. He had spent so much time building this beautiful city um, that he did not want it to just be utterly destroyed by this rebellion. And number three, 
Um, again, David still cared and loved his son. He didn't want to kill his son. And that's pretty much the only way to crush the rebellion. Um, and he, we kind of get the idea that David expected he's come back to Jerusalem. He wasn't just going to give up his kingly state. Um, because he left all of his wives to keep the palace. He's like, okay, I'll be back. I'm going to leave because people are going to try and kill me. But you're going to be fine. You stay right there. <laughs> um, so, so he leaves all of his um, wives in the castle still. In the palace. And so then, um, because you watched up there, I'm not going to spend much time talking about it, but pretty much Absalom tries um, to get wisdom from his helpers who end up being Team David instead. They give him bad advice. They go into battle. David's um, side wins because they have the Lord on their side. Lord gives them power to win. Um, as Absalom is running away, his big long hair gets stuck in the branches and he's his horse runs away and he's hanging from his hair um and so then joab one of david's officials comes around and stabs absalom to death which is a little dicey because david specifically told his people not to kill absalom because he loves them right but the guy does and absalom dead um when david hears about this he is extremely sad obviously his son just died um and he grieves for quite a bit and that brings us to the end of chapter 18. so there's four things that we see in the story that i want you to take apart or take from it not take apart take from this number one um david chose to love his children despite their sins which is good but he doesn't punish them and he doesn't give them opportunities to learn from them lessons. And that's where he goes wrong. Okay. God calls us to love people despite of their actions. However, um, sometimes we're put in roles where we, we need to provide that guidance through consequences or punishments. Um, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like, think of your dad, like your dad still loves you, whether you screw up or not, but that doesn't mean he's not going to punish you if you sneak out of the house or you, I don't know, do something weird. Um, the punishing is done when it's done out of love is done to make you stronger, wiser, um, and help you to learn from your mistakes. That is what, why God gives us these people in our lives so that we can learn, we can be better humans. But if that's not there, then it's, it's kind of not loving us because it's not helping us, right? Number two, um, it, again, it just shows us that our Heavenly Father has that unconditional love for us, um, but He still lets us serve the consequences of our, our sinful actions because it helps us out. It's that idea of the dad who loves us, but he still, you know, helps us learn by, by, um, guiding us and letting us serve the action or the consequences for our actions. Number three, um, this one again is with the bug. God always loves and forgives you. Always does. Um, doesn't mean he, we don't serve consequences, but he still always loves us. And then number four, this is kind of cool and it kind of it goes back to what we looked over for Easter. So when David finds out about Absalom's death, he says these words in 2 Samuel 18.33. He says, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, my son, Absalom. Would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. So he's saying, I want to die in your place. If only I could have died in your place. Um, this is how much I love you as your dad. Um, and it's so cool because... Before Holy Week, as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, that is actually um, parallels because Jesus weeps when he sees a city. So Jesus cries twice in the Bible. That shortest Bible verse, Jesus wept when his um, friend Lazarus dies. And then this time, he is entering Jerusalem. He sees the city and he's crying because of all the sins um, of the people and knowing what's going to happen. This happens in Luke 19, 41 through 44. And what's cool is even though David couldn't take Absalom's place, Jesus takes our place. And so we don't have to die. Um, we don't have to have eternal death. Um, but it's that he dies out of love, um, which brings us forgiveness and eternal life.